Hello, hello, and welcome to Mando Bug Crafts First Live. This is Swatch Fest Saturday. This is my brand new little series I've been starting here on YouTube where I'm going to be just hanging out with you guys while I swatch whatever I'm working on. I have recently purchased a ton of cotton yarns and that is what I'm gonna be swatching hopefully during this live, although I have a feeling that I might not get around to actually swatching anything. <laughs> we'll see what's going on. As you guys are joining in, say hi in the comments. I am new to live streaming, so it might be a little bit for me to get used to everything, but definitely say hi in the comments and I'll see if I can't pull those up because I am using StreamYard and I can do that. Uh, so real quick, if those of you who are watching this replay, in this chat, I wanna talk about how I swatch and the tools that I use to swatch. So we'll go through that and um, kind of, we'll go from there. So let's start with, my swatching tools. So let me make sure I go back to the comments so I don't miss any if anybody stops in and says hi. Uh, so I just have basic sets of crochet hooks and knitting needles that I use to swatch with. So the crochet hook set that I use is by Addy and this is their color coded hook set. And I really like this one because it reminds me of the very first hooks that I started with. I can never remember the difference between Susan Bates and boy hooks. One has a rounder tip and one's got that sharp inline. I like the rounder tip hooks because that's what I started with and that's what these hooks are like. So you can see I have some duplicates here and I have some hooks missing and that's because I, uh, I, have them in the projects that I'm working on currently. So I know where they are. My brown hook that's missing is in my Nightmare Before Christmas inspired cardigan. And then my red hook that's missing is in my Halloween mystery crochet along shawl. But I really like these hooks, like I said, because they're like the originals that I started with and they've got that nice round tip on them. And they aren't an ergonomic styled hook, but what I do like is that they're thicker than the millimeter of the hook, unlike those um, more affordable style hooks. Oh, look, now I can see chat. <laughs> oh, awesome. So hi, Lacey. Um, you do what all the time? And a hello, Marquita makes this case. Yes, I love this case. Um, and I really like the flap that helps the hooks from falling out when you're traveling with it. And I really like the snaps that close as well. So those are the crochet hooks that I use. One thing to note about them is if you are someone who likes to do amigurumi, um, they, they pop apart. And this is so that you can twist this handle. So there are lines on the handle. Oh, I should probably take the comment back down. We're learning as we're going. <laughs> um, there are lines if you wanna have some kind of um, grip when you're working and you can twist that around. So that's why they come apart, but it doesn't work well if you are like working in a really tight, dense gauge like you would for amigurumi. Uh, let's see, hello, welcome Blind Stitches Creations. Uh, Marcia Lee, I'm doing great, thank you. Working out how to do my first live. <laughs> uh, uh, good morning, Lori, thanks for stopping in. Uh, Lacey, you leave your hooks in your projects. Oh, well, yeah, right, because the worst possible thing that can happen is that you run out the door with your bag and your hook's not in there and now you're stranded without something to work on. <laughs> I've done that from swapping hooks to hooks, which is why I also have multiples in my set. And I will also, when this is full, I'll just stack them on top and close it and key store it that way because I want them all in the same place. Um, I missed the beginning. Are those hooks included in the Addy case? Was it a set? Yeah, so these sets are bought, they're sold together and this is the case that they come in if you buy the set. You can also buy the hooks individually, which is how I started because hook preferences differ from person to person. And I'm, like I said, I'm the kind that likes the round tip and I know that other people do not like this style at all. So I just got one, started working with it, loved it. I love that each size is a different color. So I'm starting to get used to, oh, my red is the 3.5 millimeter, the brown is the 6.0 millimeter. Uh, so yeah, I ended up 
buying individuals and then buying the full set because I like to have multiples for my multiple progress projects going on. I can't just work on one project at a time. Uh, make sure I didn't miss anything here. Um, blind stitch. I am fully blind. I'm working on a crochet cardigan, my own design. That is absolutely amazing. I love that, that you can do that. And I, I, I would be curious to know how you even started. How did you learn? I would love to hear that story. Uh, Marquita, where will you be uploading this live? I have to leave. I think so. Yeah. I thought that it would just do it automatically, but it, if I have to go in and figure out how to upload it, I will be. But thanks for stopping by and I hope you catch me on the replay. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so those are the crochet hooks that I use to swatch. But I'm not just a crocheter. Um, but if you are, that's fine too. I shouldn't put it like that, just. Uh, but I also like to knit. So I started with crochet and then I adventured into knitting. And this is my favorite set. Um, also Addy. So this is the Addy Grab and Go set. And what I love the most about this set, and it is pricey, don't get me wrong on that. Uh, it's a click set, but it also has the Tunisian crochet clicks. So right on front there, those are your crochet hooks, which you can use individually, but they're kind of long to do that. But they also click into a cord like you would for a circular knitting needle and there's stoppers that you can put on the end so that you could do Tunisian crochet. You can also do, um, if you got an additional click hook set, you could have a double ended circular crochet hook for a Tunisian in the round because you want the two. I've never done it, but I've kind of seen it done a little bit. Uh, so I know that's what that's for. And so it's nice to have these if I ever adventure into Tunisian crochet, but also as a knitter, if you're ever knitting a piece and then you need to pick up raw stitches, click the crochet hook onto the end of your circular needle and you can use the crochet hook to pick up all those stitches along your raw edge, click the crochet hook tip off and then put your knitting needle tip on. It is a lifesaver. I absolutely love it for that. And I have used it for that. Um, trying to keep up in the comments. <laughs> Hello, Lindsay. Managed to cook lunch just in time. Oh, I'm so glad that you were able to make the live. And uh, I haven't done my first live yet. I'm a bit nervous. Yes, I could definitely see how that would make things a little nerve wracking. I have to go live on my Kindle, but I'm no. Yes, absolutely. I'm also not monetized yet. <laughs> Back when I started YouTube, there weren't all these rules and I was monetized briefly. And then as if you've been following me for a while, you know, I stopped recording for a couple years. And so it's like this whole new world for me. Uh, so back to the hooks. Uh, so those are the Tunisian crochet hooks that come with the set and then also a full set of knitting needles that start with four millimeter and go up to uh, eight millimeter. And there's a connector cable for connecting the cords, which you wouldn't need for swatching, but it's great for projects. Um, but what I like about having a full set for swatching is I have every most every size available at my disposal to just easily go up and down in hook size if I want to, when I want to. Um, but since we're talking about this grab and go kit, the other thing I like about it is this zipper here at the top. It's a mesh pouch so you can see what's in it. It comes with all sorts of other little goodies like uh, heart stitch markers, a tapestry needle. There's heart stoppers too. These are the stoppers I was talking about that click into the end of the cord. It also comes with a gauge tool because after a while the coating that has the number on it tends to wear off. I think my six millimeter needles are missing their size because of that. And then they come with some little snippy scissors that are reminiscent of embroidery scissors, but I love that they fit. And then there's a zippered pouch in the back and that's where all of the cords it comes with are. Um, I've got a small little collection here and I don't remember all of the sizes that it comes with, but I went ahead and I picked up additional ones because you can never have enough and they all fit in here. I don't remember if these came with the kit or I bought them additionally. They're not super expensive. They're like these little, um, they're made out of some kind of grippy plastic. They're little circles and these are great for using 
the click part of the set. Sometimes on the four millimeter small needles, it can be hard to push them in and twist them to click them in place because they're so slippery with that nickel plating. These little grippy, and they're kind of sticky on one side. I don't know if you can hear that come apart. Um, they help you grab that needle and so it doesn't slip around in your hands and you can click it into place so that the needle tips don't pop off as you're working. Because if you don't hear that click when you put them in, they will come undone and that is horrible. I haven't had that happen to me personally, but I've heard horror stories, of course. All right, let's check back in with the comments. I was born with sight and lost it three years ago. Oh, so that makes sense. Okay, I love that so much. <laughs> Awesome. I will definitely have to check out your channel after this live. I think that I came across your information when I attended the crochet summit. Um, and that was an amazing experience. I know that I've met, I met Lacey. Well, I met Lacey in the alt knots channel, which it looks like that's the next comment. Hi, thank you for joining those Tunisian crochet hooks are, look killer. They, they really are. If I'm not one for Tunisian crochet, but if you are, they work great. And like I said, they work great for knitters as well. So it's worth checking out. Um, and also I should mention these larger sizes, they come in plastic because they're, once you start making larger hooks in metal, they get heavy on your hands. So I know for the whole Addy line, the larger size hooks uh, and even their knitting needles, um, they have some hollow ones that are nickel plated that are large, but I know you can also get these sparkle <laughs> ones. Um, Awesome. Five minutes in, I already want to buy a new needle. That was not the point. I was just wanted to share with you guys the tools that I use um, because they are my favorite. You know, I was fortunate enough to work at Makers Mercantile for several years and I got to learn a lot about these because it was primarily what we offered. And almost from day one of working there, I was like, couldn't wait to get a click set. And this one came out after I worked there for a couple of years and I knew when I was ready to invest in one that this was the one for me because it had the stuff for knitters and crocheters. The color coded hook set was the first one that I bought, of course. Um, hi, hi Kim, unapologetically mocha crochet and crafts. Thanks for joining me. Uh, let's see, those are pretty. Yes, I love them so much. And Lacey knows Kim too, welcome, welcome. Okay, so um, back to, those are like the basic hand tools that I use, but there's some other things that I also use when I swatch. I always have a notebook and a pen because I'm generally swatching for a design and the worst thing in the world is to swatch for a design and not write down any information like what hook size you used or how much yarn you used. Typically you can weigh your swatch when you're done and that'll tell you how much you used. But if you're doing something, I, yeah, I mentioned that my Halloween mystery crochet along has beads in it. If you're, if you're doing something that has added weight like beads, like that swatch, I needed to know how much yarn I used and having the extra beads would throw that all off. So having a notebook and pen while I'm swatching is one of the most important things that I've found. And then you need your basic tape measure. I have this one that was, I think I got for free from Washington Mutual. This one's super old. And for whatever reason, it's the one I gravitate to the most. It's missing the end. So I can't even use the end because I don't know if that's even an accurate inch. So I start somewhere in the middle. I think it's best to use a hard ruler. You get a more accurate measurement, but also use what you have. So that's what I do. Um, and so let me just make sure I'm catching up in chat. We're saying hi. Um, let me go ahead and take down my swatching tools because that's pretty much what I use to swatch. Um, and then I want to talk about how I swatch a new yarn, which is different than swatching for a pattern. Since I'm going to be swatching for all these new cotton yarns, I figured it would be best to go to explain kind of my process of how I'm going to be going about doing that. So it's probably unusual to <laughs> swatch a yarn that's new to you, right? Do you guys swatch new yarns or do you just jump right into working with them for a pattern? Let me know in the comments. I'll be curious to know. I know that before I started designing, I would just jump in with whatever. I'd find a pattern that I wanted to make and I'd be like, oh, I kind of want to try a cotton. And then I'd just 
kind of pick whatever or pick something that was recommended by somebody that I was following on social media. But now as a designer, I'm finding that I want to know more about a yarn before I choose to use it in a design. I am a little bit more leery about trying a yarn for the first time and going, okay, yep, I'm gonna recommend this to everybody. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got on this journey of asking you guys what your favorite cotton yarns were. And then I had about 15 cotton yarns. I have them all in a bin here. You may have seen my haul video that I did. And the whole plan is to swatch a crochet swatch and knit swatch and test them all out and see which ones are my favorite so that I know what I want to be designing with going forward. So, um, yeah. So when I swatch a new yarn, what I'll do is why don't we just go ahead? I just grabbed uh, Knit Picks Kotlin. So this is a DK weight yarn. Most yarns will have all the information that you need right on the back of them. So this one recommends a number five to number seven. I'm assuming that's US. It could be millimeter. It's not labeled. Uh, or a crochet hook seven I. So I think that is millimeter. Um, an I is a seven millimeter. So I go off the recommendation of the yarn to start with. So what I'll do for this yarn is I'll can actually just go ahead and do it while we're hanging out. I don't know that, yeah, I think this one goes up to a seven. I just don't know if I have it available. I only have a six, so maybe this was a bad option. But uh, this is, this one recommends a seven eye hook, and it says that you're gonna get 12 to 17 single crochets per four inches. So I use that number as my beginning chain when I'm making my swatch to give me something close to four inches. Now I know that when you're swatching for a design or you're swatching for a project and you want to meet the gauge for the design, you want to make your swatch bigger than four inches because you your edges, the gauge on your edges is a little bit different than the gauge in the middle of your swatch, which is what's gonna be most of your project. So if you make a swatch that's like six inches big, you can get the center four inches and that's gonna be your most accurate measurement. But if you're just testing a new yarn and your gauge doesn't have to be super accurate, then you can go near four inches and it's okay. And I do that frequently. Um, and so yeah, for I would just chain, I'd probably go with the bigger number. So I'd grab an eye hook, chain 17 stitches, and then I like to do my crochet swatches in double crochet because it's my favorite and I wanna see how the yarn's gonna behave in a taller stitch for whatever reason. And then I make my decisions based off of that. So um, let me see, I have some swatches here. Uh, let's see, missing comments. Absolutely, so many notebooks. Oh my gosh, that is one of my problems is I have at least five notebooks and I've tried to start labeling them so I know exactly what is in what like I have my design notebook but then I have my magazine design submissions notebook and then I have my random thoughts and sketches notebook which sometimes gets designs for both and then I have to try to transfer them and sometimes I will tape my sketch into another notebook I'm very much a hands-on person I I keep the pattern files organized on my Google Drive, but when it comes to designing, I'm very tactile. I wanna draw it out, I wanna sketch it out, I wanna keep notes in a notebook. I really need a better system for organizing my notebooks. Um, I am a very bad crochet. I'm sure you're not, Lacey. A lot of the time I will do a few stitches and a few rows until I get the fabric I'm looking for. Well, that's exactly the point of swatching and getting it all out. And you know, I actually saw a funny, um, a meme about you either your swatch is either four by four inches or it's like 40 by 20 and the joke was that you make your entire sweater and your entire sweater is your swatch um <laughs> it reminded me of that this is why i have a rocket well i don't know what a rocket book kim what is a rocket book i don't know what that is um so let's see here we'll take this banner off um I have some swatches that I did here earlier, and this was before I asked what your favorite cottons were. I was getting ready to submit a design for a magazine for their spring issue, and I knew that I wanted to use a cotton blend yarn, so I picked up a couple from my local yarn store, and one of the yarns I picked up was this Cascade Yarns Ultra Pima, and it is 100% Pima cotton. 
And I started swatching with it. I didn't end up using this for the design submission because I didn't like the way the swatches turned out for the design I had in mind. But I started with just a plain double crochet square. And you can see it's not really big, but cotton tends to be a little more denser. Sorry, I didn't weave my ends in. I typically don't weave my ends in on my swatches either because it just saves a little bit of time. Uh, cotton tends to be a little denser and heavier. And when you work in double crochet, it is it tends to be a little more see-through. So I, I started with the double crochet swatch. I liked the tension that I was getting. So then I made another swatch and linked double crochet. And this one is not see-through. I really like the way that it turned out, except it... It just, I didn't like the, I didn't like how shiny this yarn was. And I ended up going with um, like a wool blend, I believe. It was wool and linen and silk uh, instead. But I just don't, I'm not a fan of shiny tops, which is the reason I didn't go with it. I also did another swatch in this kind of stitch pattern. And I like to do that too before I go on to design a project. So, if you are interested in designing your patterns or you do design your own patterns, I know Kayla that you do design your own patterns. Um, I love to swatch in the stitch pattern first. It is taking me a while to get to the point where I can basically write the entire pattern with the swatch. Uh, it There's just a lot of math to learn before you can do that. So I used to kind of trial and error, trial and error. And now I'm finally to the point where if I do a gauge swatch, I can sit down in Excel and write the entire pattern. And it does all the math for me, which is, which is especially great if you're submitting to magazines because they can choose to go with a different yarn than what you suggest. And so if the weight changes, then when you get that new yarn and you swatch in your design pattern, you can just go back into your Excel spreadsheet, change your gauge, your pattern's already written for you for the most part, like the math is done for you and you're just following it and then you're writing the technical side of it. Uh, but when it comes time to come up with stitch patterns, this is my all time favorite book for that. This is the complete book of crochet stitch design and it's a great starting point for playing with stitch patterns when you are designing. Um, let me catch up with you guys. The rocket book, yes, I did wanna know what that was. It's an erasable notebook. Oh, okay. And you snap a foot and the, so it, do you, so you write it and then you take a picture of it and then you erase it. So like a reusable notebook, if I'm understanding that correctly, that's interesting. Um, I think that would be something fun to use with, I know some people have been talking about Airtable. I haven't gotten into it just because I know there's going to be a learning curve and I'm going to have to sit down for a certain amount of time before I figure it out. But I feel like that might go hand in hand. Um, then you wipe it off and use it again. So that's exactly what you said. Okay, you're looking for a good stitch. Lacey, I highly recommend this stitch dictionary for that reason. It, it's the most comprehensive stitch dictionary that I've come across. Uh, it's got all of your basics um, and everything's done in white, which I also like. So it's got um, a pictorial index if you were just looking to kind of skim through and then it tells you what page to go to. Um, and then all of the stitch patterns as well are charted, which I appreciate. That's another thing that I'll do when I'm designing is I frequently start with a uh, a grid and I created my own grid for my double crochet gauge that I typically use so that I can see the stitches in real size. It became a problem for my Halloween mystery crochet along design because it's such a big design and I made the chart full size. So I, <laughs> for the longest time, I have a cork board in my kitchen and I just use tacks and I had the chart tacked up to the cork board that's in my kitchen, like one of those giant cork boards. I usually put my kids art from school on there, but for like months, this chart was just tacked over the top of everything. And even now as I'm working with it, if it's at its full size, it's like this big and I have to fold it up all tiny to try to get to just the section I'm working on. But all that to say, I like to chart my designs and this is great for that because 
there's the picture, there's the chart, there's the written instructions that also helps when it comes time to write it out. Sometimes I will use exactly the stitch that's in the dictionary, but it's not by itself and I add some flair of my own or I use it as a detail piece. Sometimes I use it as a starting point and then I veer off from there modifying lines, rows, repeats, whatever, but I find it to be the most inspirational stitch dictionary for me personally. Um, and it's massive. It's massive. It's comprehensive. It's got sections that are set up by like dent stitches, post stitches, more lace open work, uh, chevrons. And I just, I really love it. I really love it. And I really recommend it. Um, okay. I always wear that. I'll get one, but they're not. I mean, I have a couple and I have some that are knit and crochet and there is one that I have that's knit and crochet and it has them in multiple colors. And I really enjoy that aspect for coming up with some color work ideas. But this is like, if I could only buy one, this is the one, this is the one that I come back to over and over again. I have like A to Z crochet is another stitch dictionary. Um, I have like this crochet workshop intermediate one that has like some stitch dictionary stuff in the back. I just don't pull those out as much because this one also has the most of the stitches, if not all of them, plus all of the extras. So if you're only going to get one, this is the one that I recommend. Um, yes. Yes, Kim, that would be great for the sample or shawl that you want to make. It It's really easy to just thumb through, pick the next stitch and go from there. Or if you wanted to make a sample or blanket instead, again, I really, really like this one. Um, so that was... I think everything that I wanted to talk about, about how I swatch and what I swatch with. So I might as well start swatching along with you guys. Although I don't, I gotta make sure I have the right hooks. Um, so let, I wanna know though, um, what did I, did I share one of your favorite cotton yarns in that cotton yarn haul video, if you've seen it. And if you haven't, just let me know what your favorite cotton yarn is. I got quite a few, but I know that this isn't even a fraction of what's available in the market. And I'm always looking to find, you know, another yarn to try. Like I said, I want to make sure the more yarns I get my hands on, the better I have an idea of what I really like and what I don't like and what I want to use going forward. So let me know which cotton yarns you like. I think I'm going to start with this 24-7 cotton. I got a lot of recommendations for Lion Brand. Um, the two big ones were the 24-7 Cotton and Kobu. And I think someone recommended Trubu, but it doesn't have any cotton in it, so I didn't pick it up. Um, I was trying to stay away from completely bamboo just because the more I learn about it, the more I'm like trying to make more eco-conscious, eco-friendly decisions when it comes to um, yarn. I know that I'm willing to work with anything and everything. And I do understand that everything has its place, but I'm trying to make the best choices when I can. And it was one of those shocker moments when I found out that bamboo isn't really all that natural. It blew my mind. So I, I have worked with bamboo blends. I do work with bamboo blends. I do like the way that bamboo behaves in a yarn. It has amazing drape. It's silky smooth. A lot of those synthetic viscose rayon yarns will give you that silky smooth artificial silk uh, feeling, which is why they were created. They were trying to become an artificial silk and they behave like one and it's really nice and it's a lot more friendly to your budget. But I know that the chemical treatment process is a little crazy. If you're interested, there's a really good video by Yarn University. You like E-W-E, like the sheep. Yarn University did a video on biosynthetic fibers. And in the video, she actually put like footage of how uh, viscose from bamboo is created. And it's nuts. Like the <laughs> just watching it become like sludge. <laughs> it kind of reminds me like when you watch videos about what chicken nuggets look like before they become chicken nuggets. <laughs> Just honestly. Uh, uh, Pima cotton. Pima cotton or cotton linens and cotton bamboo. Um, yeah. Okay. So about this being heavy, that is one thing that I noticed is it's almost like 
originally when I looked at it, I thought that this 24 seven cotton was a chainette, but it's almost like cabled or braided, which I think is why it's so heavy is because of the way that it's constructed. And this was the only cotton yarn that I bought that was constructed in this way. So I'm curious to see how much of a difference this swatch has when I compare it to all the other ones, when I get them out lined up, which I did the math on, that's gonna be 30 swatches. <laughs> I'm gonna be swatching these cottons all summer long, but that's okay. I'm really excited to do it. And I'm really excited to see and feel the difference. And it's, it's gonna be a learning experience overall. And I'm really excited to be able to share that with you guys. And you don't have to buy all the yarns, I already did it. And you can just see what they look like. Um, but of course, you'll have to make your own opinions outside of my own because I most likely have different preferences than you do. Um, another Pima Cotton fan. Okay. Uh, it, I, what is it about the Pima Cotton that makes it your favorite? I haven't really had a lot of experience with cotton other than just like basic cottons. And I've mostly worked with organic cottons. Um, <laughs> oh no, chicken nugget. Fan. This is what it looked like. They're like squeezing it through tubes. It was... Oh, it was gross. 24-7 Kobu and Kobasi. Oh my gosh. Kobasi. That is one that I have worked with and I know I love because of the stretch factor that comes with it. Um, you got Cotton Kings, but I prefer Rainbow. Yes. So I um, I keep seeing that Hobie's having fantastic sales. So um, I am tempted to go back and get a full set of their Rainbow Cotton because they're gorgeous colors and it's just part of the cotton experiment. And yeah, got to try the Pima Cotton. That's where I'm at. I have some Pima cottons in here. Um, I will slowly get to them. This 24 seven cotton is 100% mercerized cotton, which means that it was chemically treated to give the cotton more strength and durability. It also provides that shine that you see, which I'm not a super fan of, but maybe I will find a way that it works for me. Um, Lacey coming in about the Pima. It's got Drape, Organic Pima from Knit Crate. I've heard that from other people as well, that they've gotten organic or Pima cotton out of Knit Crate that they really, really love. And it's incredibly soft. So um, I've never ordered from Knit Crate before. I feel like I'm missing out now. Uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, let's see. This is recommending a 6.0. And I have a 6.0 right here. And this one's recommending how many stitches it says. Uh, oh, no, not a 6.0, a 4.0. Do you ever do that? Do you ever see the U.S. size and grab that size when you really mean the millimeter? I do that all the time. It is really frustrating. 4.0 millimeter hook is one of my favorites. So that's why I know it's the green one automatically. And it is saying that for a crochet, they're recommending 14 stitches. So I'm just going to do... 16 or so. Let's see here. I'm wanting to try that rainbow cotton too, right? I keep seeing their ads because, you know, targeted ads are the best, right? <laughs> they really get you right when they know that you're your most vulnerable. Uh, that shine on the 24-7 dulls a bit after you use it. Oh, that's interesting to know. I wonder if that has to do with the I wonder if the treatment wears off or if it's actually like a chemically bonded process. I am not a chemist. I don't know a lot about the science behind how the chemical treatment of yarn actually works. Uh, I know that with superwash wool, from what I've read, it's like a chemical treating outer coating that wears off over time. So while superwash is durable, eventually that coating wears down and then what's left underneath is a very weak wool because they treat it to strip the scales before they put that coating over the top. Uh, so I do know that about superwash wool, but I don't I don't know a whole lot about cotton, which is why I'm kind of jumping down this road of buying all the cottons that are recommended and working with all of the cottons that are recommended. See, I keep saying I'm going to drop my subscription from Knit Crate because of, the, oh, so they went up in price, um, but then they bring out the exotic blends. I am also a sucker for exotic blends, like so hard, uh, especially when it comes to spinning. So that I think is where I really started to get a foundational knowledge of what makes up a yarn and what kind of properties you get from a yarn based on its contents, its structure, its ply, its weight. Uh, 
starting and making yarn from scratch, you really get a good idea of everything that goes into it. And you start to learn how to customize what you're making so that what you get in the end is exactly what you want. Um, and then applying that knowledge to commercial yarn has been one of my new favorite things, <laughs> which is also why I'm down this rabbit hole of swatching all of these cotton yarns. But the exotic blends, I'm always up for trying something new, learning something new and something that's different, which actually I have to admit out of all of the yarns that I purchased that are cotton and cotton blend yarns that you recommended, I don't think one of them was actually recommended. I think I just got excited about it and added it to my cart. Uh, I'd have to go back and check on Instagram and check the contents. But when I was shopping on nitpicks, and I was looking under their cotton yarns to find the Kotlin and uh, Comfy. And there was another one that was recommended. I found this Kindred. And this one just really stood out to me because it's an alpaca cotton blend. And the color is nice. I really like the way that it marls. And I just want to know how it's going to behave because I've never worked with a yarn that's this unique alpaca and cotton. I don't, I know the individual properties of alpaca. I know the individual properties of cotton, but not in a blend like this. It's primarily alpaca, but it's got the cotton. I know that it's going to be too hot for summer, but I still want to know how that cotton's going to behave with the alpaca. Is it going to help it keep its structure? Because alpaca is a fiber that just grows and grows and grows. Um, it, it's not great for garments in a hundred percent alpaca for that reason, but it's really warm, which would make it ideal for a garment to stay warm. I see alpaca often used for things like ponchos where it's a wearable, but doesn't have to be fitted so that it's, you know, like ponchos are basically wearable blankets, right? So I'm wondering if this kindred with this cotton, would that make alpaca a more suitable content for a garment? Will it give it that hold? I know cotton when it's wet will stretch out, but Alpaca should have the wicking abilities to keep it dry. Like this one just blows my mind and I'm really excited to give it a try. Uh, let's see. I totally blame Reggie from J Hook Crochet for my love of fancy yarns. I feel in love during one of her yarn adversity lives. Yeah, so Lacey got me hooked on J Hook's lives and they are fantastic. I I think I joined right after she did her crochet design series, but I watched one that was about how to support your favorite makers online. And I really enjoyed that one. And then I got to catch one of her lives about uh, like crochet on the runway. And that one was hilarious and a lot of fun because some of the designs were great. Some of the designs were absolutely horrible. Um, Oh, I'm getting some of that. You must be talking about uh, the Kindred. Yeah, I, I'm i just really curious about it. I want to know, what what are you like? What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, Kim Lee, Reggie is the great enabler. She introduced me to Hobie. You know, my second home. <laughs> I feel like Hobie is slowly going to become my second home. I really like the yarns that I've gotten from them that I've been working with. And so far, I don't know if this seems to be the case all the time, but they have amazing sales. Like the, you, you get a really good deal on the yarn and it's good quality. I don't typically buy acrylic. So my fiber purchases are on the spendier end because I'm looking for merino wool or superwash wool or alpaca. I like to use natural fibers and they're spendier because of livestock. Uh, so I found that you can still get a really good deal on wool and superwash wool. And that unicorn yarn that I bought, I bought the solid because the hand painted were mostly out of stock. I didn't like the colors that were available, but I mean, it's hand dyed yarn. And one of the times that I saw an ad, it was on sale for $13 for a fingering weight hank of hand dyed yarn, which blows my mind. Uh, so while it may be not always in stock, you definitely can get a good deal when it is available. But of course, I'm still that person who will spend $28 on uh, indie dyed yarn on Etsy. So I can't say too much. But if you're looking for a good deal, if you're on a budget, um, which I should reel mine in a little bit better, but <laughs> uh, I really think you can find some good deals on Hobie as well. So I'm working up this 24-7 cotton and I do see already 
how it's a little heavier. It's a worsted weight cotton. And because of its structure, it doesn't really fill that double crochet space because it's more like a tightly knotted structure. And with something like this, right, with something like double crochet, where you see through the space, I could choose to go down in hook size, but I'm not going to because if I drop below the recommended hook size, what's going to happen is these stitches are going to get tighter and they're going to get denser. And then my fabric is going to be even heavier and stiffer. And when I'm looking at using these cotton yarns, I'm not looking at them to make something like a bag. I'm looking at them to make something like a wearable. So you don't want a cardboard jacket. It's especially a heavy cardboard jacket. So I'm going to keep my swatch at the recommended hook size, especially because that's going to give me a starting point for this yarn. But it's not looking like this would be an ideal yarn for something that you didn't want to see through. Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't make something that was more lacy and open and it will be something a little more ideal. I guess the benefit to this yarn would be that if you wanted something op open and lacy, you could do something simple like a double crochet stitch and still have that breathability without actually having to put lace into it. So that's something that could be a potential use. Let's see. Okay, I'm here now. Hi, Reggie. And see you blaming me for my stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I am here to support all other yarn enablers as well. Uh, that is what we're here for, is it not? <laughs> to find the things that we love and share the things that we love. And, you know, the point is not to make you go crazy and blow out your budget, budget but that's what we all pretty much do, is it, <laughs> is it not? It's always the game of, I don't need more yarn. I don't need more yarn. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Uh, but I mean, there's something to be said about being that inspirational. Uh, Marquita, thank you so much for showing us the 24 seven cotton. I think I would prefer the lion brand. Oh, baby cotton. Oh, so I didn't see that one. I didn't browse too much outside of what was recommended by you guys on Instagram. So I am curious what that, I wonder what the baby means. It must mean potentially a finer weight of cotton. And that is one thing that I noticed about the cotton that I picked up is that I'm already gravitating more towards the finer weight cottons. And I, I'm excited to see how those work up because naturally by being thinner, it's not going to be as heavy. So your piece isn't going to be as heavy. So I am excited to try those out. Um, now I kind of wish I would have browsed Lion Brands cotton blends a little bit more. And the other company that I didn't get recommended at all, which I'm kind of bummed about because they are quickly becoming one of my favorite companies to go to when it comes to designing is Barocco. Um, I recently did a sweater out of their yarn and I really, really loved it. And they have some really cool summer yarns. One of them that I picked up and maybe I'll just swatch it and add it to this pile, even though it wasn't recommended, is ch I think it's pronounced chai, like the tea, chai, uh, which is funny because chai means tea in several languages outside of English. So when you say chai tea, it's like saying tea tea. But chai tea, or not chai tea, Barocco chai is, I want to say 50%. Oh, no, now I'm going to get this wrong. It's, I think it's linen and silk. And it has this really cool fleck to it, oh, which also isn't cotton, so that one wouldn't count. But they do have some cool cotton blends. Uh, so maybe after I finish all of these cotton yarns, I'll have to go wrangle up a whole new set of cotton and cotton blend yarns of my own for another set of swatching. <laughs> all right, let's catch back up with chat. Um, I don't call it blame you. I give you credit. <laughs> Lacey is everybody's hype woman. We were talking about that. She is the best hype woman that I've come across. She is so great about that. Hey, Reggie, you know we love you, even if our wallets are shaking their fists at you. This is true, Kim. Uh, yes, yes. 
Yes, the O baby is finer and so light, but not a lot of yardage. Well, that's interesting. So it must be like a 25 gram put up then if you're not getting that much yardage because you generally see quite a tick up in yardage when you're working with a finer weight, but that all depends. And that's something that's been a slow learning process for me as well. When I was working at the yarn shop, one of the things that happened the most would be customers coming in going, I found this great, amazing pattern, but I can't get this yarn. It's discontinued or, you know, I can't find it anywhere and I can't find it online. What is a yarn substitute? So I spent <laughs> a good amount of my time at the yarn stores helping people find appropriate yarn substitutions. And then they typically came back to work on that project in the shop or come back for help on that project. So I got to see how the substitutions actually played out in the long run, which was a great experience. And one of the things that I used to do that I don't do anymore is I used to say, well, basically you can go off of the weight of the yarn and the yardage of the yarn. If the weight and yardage are close, you can substitute, but that doesn't factor in the yarn contents whatsoever. And when you're looking at something like cotton, which typically tends to be heavier to get that bulk, you're not going to get as many yards with a cotton as you are with something that's like a wool that can be spun woolen and open and airy and it can really be drawn out. And even the differences between a worsted wool and a woolen wool, which that's a whole rabbit hole that I'm not gonna get into, but it has to do with the way that the wool is prepped and spun. One being airy and open and the other one being compact and tight, that will affect your yardage even. So you have to take more into account than just how much does this yarn weigh and how many yards are in it, you also have to take into account the fiber content. So it's a combination of the two. If the original design was 100% silk uh, and you wanna substitute that and you don't wanna pay for 100% silk, there is wiggle room of course, but it's gonna be a little bit of a trial and error. You're gonna have to look more at the gauge of the pattern and the recommended gauge on the yarn. And then also what that yarn behaves like in that stitch, like we're talking about here, this gauge in cotton, let's say we got this gauge in wool, it might not be as see-through, right? So that's that's one of the reasons co uh, contents really, really matters. And I kind of got off on a tangent there. Uh, let's see, just get all the cotton. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's basically where I'm at. I went through all this um, adventuring through wool and uh, natural fibers. Now it's time for me to get into the plant fibers. I said natural fibers. I meant animal fibers. Now it's time to get into all of the cotton fibers and learn everything that there is possibly to know about cotton. Because, I mean, look at the differences between the 24-7 cotton, right? And then when you look at this one, just it's so different. So this is the blue sky alpaca or blue sky fibers organic worsted cotton. This is only two plies. And so it's light and it's fluffy and it's not gonna be as see-through as this. It's not mercerized, it's organic. Uh, it's also not as strong. You could easily pull this apart and it has a halo and I can tell that it's gonna get a little pilly, but just this level of difference in cotton is really exciting to explore. Uh, best cotton is Hobie. Ra okay, so now I'm literally going to have to get off this live and go order some of that rainbow. Uh, I did not pick it up and I keep seeing it and I want it. And that's enough recommendations for me to go ahead and get some. <laughs> uh, I've made a, ba a lot of bags with 24-7. It's recommended yard for mosaic crochet. Oh, so like mosaic crochet for a bag, I'm assuming, or do you mean in general? And I'm wondering why that is. I do, I am noticing that it it has, I don't know if my webcam will pick this up very well, but it does have a very round appearance to it. So it, it I guess maybe it would give a nice contrast between the color changes potentially. Um, that's gorgeous. Are you talking about the organic fibers. I know there I've started a baby blanket out of them and I, I probably should have shared that today as well, but I'll probably wait to share it when I'm swatching again with that yarn. It has great stitch definition and it's super soft. Um, Mocha, that makes sense. I've been wanting to do mosaic too. So when it comes to mosaic crochet, I'm not super familiar 
with how it works. I recently cleaned out my shed and I came across some very, very, very old projects. I mean, I say very, very old. I would guess 2012. Is that old enough? It's almost 10 years old. And I look, it looks like I did, in fact, crochet a mosaic scarf back then, but I don't have much recollection of it at all. And I do like the way that it looks. And I don't know if you guys have seen these designs on, I've, se I've seen them on Instagram. I'm sure they're all over um, Etsy and Ravelry and wherever you like to eat your patterns as well. But I believe her name is Six Sixel Designs. She has some mosaic crochet designs that are Halloween inspired, which you know is right up my alley. And she's got this pumpkin one that she turned into a pillow. And I think I need to do mosaic crochet just for that pillow alone. But she's also coming out with a skeleton, um, skeleton and skull. Uh, and I believe it's mosaic crochet blanket and it is amazing and so i think that would just be another skill to add to the designing repertoire of because at least for me starting out designing sorry and i could take that back down starting out with designing my struggle was that i had ideas that i wanted to make but i didn't have the skills to make them and that is really frustrating when you're starting out because it's a lot of trial and error and it's a lot of frogging and it just seems like this massive mountain of learning that's needed to get to that point. Uh, if you guys have looked at any of my independent designs, the first design that I published for sale is Hollowweb and that design um, I had sketched for a while and just didn't have the skills to create it. And even when I did create it, I made three versions before I published it and it just took forever because I had to learn all of the math that went into it. I, <laughs> the design is a semicircular shawl, which I used the shaping that I had the knowledge of from an amigurumi, which is that you can start with six single crochet. And as long as you're increasing six stitches on your increase row, you will, it will lay flat. And so that's what I did for my shaping on that semicircular shawl is I have my, I think it's six increases that I went with and every row you're increasing six stitches except for the lace sections. There are no increases. So you have to make sure the lace increases on its own and it's a different stitch multiple each of those lace sections so that when you end your lace repeat, you have to make sure you're back on track to evenly put in those six increases again it just was so much work. And so, yeah, that's my side story about the hurdle of becoming a designer, having these ideas in your mind, but not the skills yet to implement them. I don't have any ideas for color work patterns currently, but I think picking up mosaic crochet as a skill will be nice to have in the tool belt so that if I ever do go, oh, I would love to do this color work design and traditional color work isn't going to work as good as mosaic would here. So it's all about building up that uh, skill set. Uh, yes, the pretty blue looks so fluffy and soft. It is so fluffy and soft, that organic um, mosaic and tapestry crochet in general. Yeah, I've only done tapestry crochet a couple times uh, and the color management gets to me. Um, I fell into a mosaic project doing Marley Bird MCAL and I was like, mm, <laughs> what is this witchcraft they are telling me to do now? work into previous rows. That is the great thing about YouTube now. When I learned to crochet, YouTube did not exist and you could not watch a video on how to do it. You had to rely on pictures and words. Uh, luckily, there were a lot of um, places that you could go to get that stuff, but it really you were really limited to either what you could purchase or what you could pick up in the library or what you knew somebody else had and you could share books and resources that way. This is such a beautiful shawl. What shawl is that? I think I missed that one. Oh, hollow web. <laughs> uh, it's, oops, it's six. I'm working on hollow web right now. Yes, knit whim. Lindsay, uh, so I fell through on Lindsay. She loves to work with lace weight yarn. And I <laughs> was like, oh yeah, I will definitely make a lace weight hollow web shawl. And I started one, quickly realized just how much math it was going to be all over again. Because when you, even, even the jump between fingering weight and lace weight the stitch gauge changes so significantly that it really messes with the lace 
designs. Instead of being this big, they're now this big. And so you can't just do one repeat because your shawl would be tiny. And I didn't want to have to figure out how to keep increasing those lace sections. So I frogged and abandoned my lace hollow web shawl, but Lindsay has kept on going and I feel like she's basically a crochet designer at this point with all of the math and work that she's had to do to keep this project alive. And it's really amazing. You should check it out if you're interested. I recently created a Facebook group uh, called Mando Bugs Crafty Corner. And I think I linked it in the description box. I don't remember. It might be at the bottom. And she shared her progress photo of her shawl in there. And it is gorgeous. It's uh, black and gray with bright orange beads. I really love how it's coming along. Um, so if you're interested, you can join our group and of course share anything that you're working on in there as well. Uh, yes, I made a crochet version of the knit collage Harley sweater and have no idea how explain what I did. <laughs> yes. And that is, I don't have the ter the terminology to share it. So that is also one of the struggles um, that I experienced starting out designing as well is I wasn't very good about keeping notes. I was still learning what I was doing. So it was hard to write it down and make it so that other people could follow it. And sometimes with crochet, it can feel like there aren't any standards when it comes to designing patterns. And so what really leveled up my designing for me was taking Edie Ekman's How to Write It class. And she covers your basic standards and then acceptable fudge room, right? There's there's room to have your own writing style that is still understandable. And she clearly breaks down the absolutely do not do's because it's too confusing when you write it X way. And I like the way that she does it. At least when I took the class, she had us do homework and then she shared our homework without our names on it. And we got to see how everyone wrote the same pattern. And we kind of went over the good things and the bad things. And it just was overall great experience. And that really gave me a lot of confidence in writing patterns, as well as hiring a good tech editor too. That that really helps. Um, when I designed the Oh Yes hat, I struggled to explain some of the stitches that were in the decreases of the crown because it included linked double crochet stitch decreases. And I had never seen that anywhere. And I just wasn't quite sure how to write it. And that my tech editor really helped me with that. Uh, my head hurts trying to figure that out. Yes, you must be talking about the hollow web math. And yes, absolutely. It Sometimes when I'm sitting down with Excel for a sweater and I'm like in it, my I start to get a headache <laughs> because it's just, it's not just math, it's that problem solving math where you have to decide like these are this is what I have this is how I'm trying to get there how do these numbers need to fit into a formula to, to do the things that I want them to do and then double checking yourself afterwards the the thing that's the hardest with something like that is all of the shaping that goes into a sweater once you start adding multiple colors and multiple stitch patterns and the grading of it you start running into things like, well, I need a multiple of four plus two, but you have to minus this part because we're not in pattern on that part. And we need to do it for this many inches and the formula gets big and then your head starts to hurt. I have to take breaks. Although I do like to sit down and do it all at once and then take a break and then come back to it. Um, what else? I appreciate you so much. Thank you for the tips. Of course, Marquita, I'm here to share everything that I can um, when I can. I... I definitely support any and everyone who wants to design their own patterns. I think that it is a great way to express your creativity and there is definitely room for everyone to be doing it because there is just so much room for what you can do in crochet that one person can't possibly do it all. And everybody has their own style and flair and preferences. And I think the more people that want to design and learn to design and can share patterns, the better the entire the, like the whole industry benefits from something like that. So I'm here to share anything and everything that I can. And yeah, so you are welcome. Awesome. Well, look at that. I almost got a swatch done. I didn't even think that I'd be able to crochet at all while I was chatting with you guys. Um, I hope that I've been doing an okay keeping up with chat. This is all new to me. It, this is my first time using this webcam and my first time using this microphone. So hopefully that all worked out well. Um, but it is looking like our live stream is coming to an end. 
So I appreciate everyone who showed up and hung out with me today. Thank you for spending time with me. And hopefully I will see you next Saturday for the next Swatch Fest. All right. Until then, everybody, happy crafting. Bye.